Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but for a reason, it's chop the wood. Like, you have to do the work. I mean, it's, you know, there's so many, you know, it's a little different if you're talking about writing books or, or writing for, you know, Hollywood or whatever. But, um, you know, in the film and TV side, there's so much, you know, networking and moving around and pitching and stuff that you feel like you just got to ride that wave. But at the end of the day, you can take a million meetings. You got to go home and write the thing. You got to write the thing. And yeah, then you have to get out and sell it and, you know, try to promote it because there's su such a glut of other people doing it. But um, that's what you have to do. Welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. In this podcast, you will experience wisdom, advice, and stories from creatives all over the world. Your host is Amani Roberts, who is a DJ, music producer, professor, avid book reader, and developing salsa dancer. On the show, we love to share the stories of creative professionals especially people who've gone from the corporate life to the creative life. Once again, welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome to episode 39 of the Amani Experience Podcast. For this show, we have Peter Nelson with us. Peter is a award-winning children's author and screenwriter. Some of my favorite things about this show is that Peter is super funny, so we're laughing throughout the entire interview. It was a lot of fun. He's got some great stories. I particularly enjoyed his story about the leave behinds that he designed and created. That was really interesting. I also enjoyed how he talked about how you have to chop the wood, which is basically just doing the work day in and day out. I respected that. I'm glad he shared that with us. So I think you're going to enjoy this interview. Let's get to a review. We have a review from Vision Reached. It says, this is a fantastic show. Amani asks deep, meaningful, and rich questions that leads to thoughtful stories and topics of conversation. This podcast is definitely one to put into your collection. Thank you very much for that review, Vision Reached. Please remember to leave us a review on iTunes and rate us. We really appreciate the support. And now to the show we go. Enjoy. Welcome back to the show. I'm going to read our guest bio and then we'll get right to our interview. Our guest today is a writer and children's book author who lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Diane. Their two human sons, Charlie and Christopher, and their non-human son, a dog, Fred. Our guest grew up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where at age nine, he penned his earliest known work, The Toilet Bowl That Ate Up New York City. In high school, his human essay on how 80s movies and TV shows stupidly depicted being a teenager was published by the Cape Cod Times, winning him his hometown paper's first and possibly last Young Author of the Month award. Our guest today graduated from Syracuse University in 1989 with a dual major in English and advertising. As a graphic designer, he freelanced for agencies in San Francisco, where he lived for five years, until one fateful evening he discovered that people got paid to write TV sitcoms. He moved his new wife to L.A. in 1994, writing specs at night and continuing to freelance at ad agencies by day. I would like to welcome Peter Nelson to the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for, me. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. We're excited to have you here, um, and we have a lot of stuff to cover today. First of all, Syracuse class of 1989. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> He's still very young, still very young. You were there when Indiana versus Syracuse, correct? That's right. Yeah, the Keith Smart game. That's right. It's a biggie. It's a biggie. Yeah, yeah. Did you actually attend the game? I did not. I was one of those kind of uh, <laughs> burnout people who didn't go to a lot of the games, but I was. you could not be not aware of Syracuse basketball, especially then. Right. Now, they're doing pretty well these days, too. Good, good. So let's let's kind of learn something about you as you were growing up. First, talk to us about what were some of the strange games you made up for your younger brothers that kind of tormented them back in the day? Oh, gosh, I don't think it tormented them so much <laughs> as in, they enjoyed them, actually. So they've told me um, <laughs> I was kind of a weird I was the oldest of three and we're four years apart each. And my two younger brothers, I was always just into coming up with weird fantasy games and doing stuff with them. I mean, as embarrassingly close to getting into my teens, <laughs> I would still hang out and like do puppet shows for my brother's friends and stuff, which led into what I ended up doing, obviously. But um, yeah, we came up with some wild just games, something called Quest for the Key, where I would like <laughs> found this old antique key and I would hide it, not just in the house, but out in the yard and across the street. And I'd leave clues and maps and 
It was very sort of Tolkien-inspired stuff, and they just ate it up. They loved it. I'm sure they all grew it before I did, which is pretty embarrassing. <laughs> Your creativity started at a very young age. I was a bit of a freak, yeah. <laughs> What was it? How did you come up with a topic for your high school essay in terms of how movies and sitcoms poorly depict being a teenager? Yeah, this was sort of the 80s, the John Hughes era and Fast <laughs> Times and stuff, but yes. yet the ABC after school specials was still around. I don't know if anyone even knows what I'm talking about. But um, Google it. <laughs> yeah, it was this contest that came up. I was a senior in high school and I... I had okay grades. I knew I needed to kind of pump up the college possibilities. So this thing came along and I just sat down and banged out this story just about how, you know, the, the way we're depicted either as crazy party kids in Fast Times or as love lorn, <laughs> you know, lonely people in John Hughes movies or as weirdo that we're going to all die of drugs any minute now from after school specials and I said it's actually really boring we do homework it, I mean it was okay but for some reason they really dug it and yeah I won this thing I got published it was like the first sweet taste of publication and publishing and so all my friends you know I grew up on Cape Cod so it's a lot of mass hole type people <laughs> so all my friends were like hey it's the author look at this guy huh? yes and uh yeah so cool Growing up, you know, I was a big John Hughes fan, Some Kind of Wonderful. That's one of my favorites by him. Oh, that yeah. and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. Love I, those movies. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Now, you went to Syracuse, and then you graduated in 89. And after graduation, you moved to San Francisco? Yeah. My girlfriend then, now wife, Diane, and I drove across the country and uh, kind of couch surfed for a while and then got places. And she started working in advertising. And I worked for a graphic design company of all the things... Of, with writing and everything, this will be a theme today. I, I never really occurred to me that you could actually write, or I never took it seriously enough for myself. So I was sort of always ducking fate for a lot of years. <laughs> and one of those things was to do graphic design because I could be visual, I could mm -hmm. tell a story, I could put my humor in things. Um, so I did that at a, at a graphic company in San Francisco that catered to a ton of advertising agencies around Battery Park in that area. And it was good because it really helped some bread and butter issues down the road for me. I was always kind of able to find work doing that, no matter what else I wanted to do. Okay. And then you were in advertising until probably, or you graphic design until like 94. Talk to us about this fateful evening. What happened when you discovered that people got paid to write TV sitcoms and that kind of flipped yeah, the switch? Yeah, that's kind of the thing that made me finally punch me in the face and said, dude, just write. You know? <laughs> and what happened was it was in San Francisco and I had a very funny friend who we used to just go out drinking and we would just riff on stuff like you do. And um, one night we're sitting there and we're drinking and he's buying all the beers. Like he's getting me drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm fine with that. And uh, <laughs> so then he kind of creepily goes, hey, let's get out of here. Let's go to my apartment. And he takes me back to his apartment and he whips out his Roseanne spec script. Okay. And that's how old I am. And I'm looking at this thing like, what is this? And he said, it's a Roseanne script. And I swear to God, I'd never until that moment actually, I mean, I knew, but I never, it occurred to me that people got paid to do this. And I was like, well, do you know Roseanne? And he's like, no, dumbass. Like, I wrote this. I want to do this. And I, I was like, it was all kind of crashing on my buzzed head. And I was like, good for you. That's great. And he said, well, you know, I want you to read it. You're funny. I'm, I want you to tell me if it's funny. I've never. And I, I said, oh. And I sat down on his carpet, and he probably got me another beer. And I started reading it. And I, you know, I knew the show. I wasn't a big fan, but I'd seen it enough. And I could hear every voice in my head. I could hear the laugh track where it would come. I could hear when there should have been a laugh track. Like there's not the jokes aren't coming fast enough. It was the strangest experience. It was like I was watching the sh a bad episode in my head. Nice. And I said, "Give me a pen." And I just started. This she'd never say this. Actually, this is not. No, no. He would never say this. Actually, have them come here. How about if you did this? And he's just sitting there on his bed, grinning at me. <laughs> and I, it was his plan all along. And he talked me into moving down to L.A. and say, "Let's do this together." And we did. He moved down to Sam to L.A. I moved down a little after that, and then my wife, young wife at that time, then kind of waited to find a job, luckily, in L.A. before she came down. So I right. crashed on his couch for a while, and we just got into it, and that was kind of, I never looked back, really. That was the turning point. So then yeah. from 94, you moved down. How did you, like, you probably had to get a job, like, in... I'm not, well, advertising, is that when you worked in advertising? I stayed, yeah, and it was, I was lucky because I had enough contacts through San Francisco and a portfolio at that point that I shopped it around and, you know, a lot of the same agencies, some new ones. Um, BBDOS was a huge uh, 
you know, supporter of me, whether they knew it or not. They didn't know I was printing out <laughs> scripts in their mailroom at night. But um, yeah, so I did that and I did graphic design at ad agencies, which if you don't know, that's like doing new business pitches and things like that. So you're sort of the poor creative cousin of all the cool guys who do the yeah. art direction and stuff. But, uh, you know, and again, I was kind of, I'd come in and it was all freelance too. So I made a great day rate and, uh, you know, they offered to hire me a couple times and I was like, I don't know, you know, can you pay? And they were like, no, that's why we want to hire you. And I was like, well then, because I needed, I would do a week stint where you do an all-nighters for a Levi's pitch or Apple or whatever. And then I would just go home and sleep for two days and then I'd get up and start writing my spec scripts again, right. you know? And so it was kind of a perfect grind for me. And we, you know, my wife and I were living up in Laurel Canyon and we were, had this rock and roll lifestyle and stuff. And it was great. It was really fun. Um, and we're just, I was trying to get, you know, get agents by that point and just keep cranking on the writing thing, you know? So it was good bread and butter while I could get it. How did you manage your time being so young in your career with writing your spec scripts at nighttime and still managing a full-time job during the day? Because that can be tough for people to kind of balance the two. It is. And you know, I know how lucky I was. A lot of people do much tougher jobs than I had, you know, whether it's waiting tables, but you know, this is the town where you do whatever you have to. And <laughs> so I was really blessed in that way because it wasn't a full-time job. It was a full-time job. It was a beyond full-time job for a week at a time and then they would pay me a boatload of money for doing you know double time overnighters whatever it took putting together you know leave behinds where i would always by the way bring in my sense of humor to stuff which is i think why they kept me around <laughs> is you know if it was a weather channel pitch they wanted me to just do some sort something to you know to leave behind a little gift thing to right. and i would i went out and i'd buy like how many how many executives are going to be in the room okay 15 i'd buy 15 snow globes at oz and i would take them apart and I would take out whatever LA bullshit was inside there and I would build like a little 50s family watching a TV nice. with the BBDO logo on it and then fill it with snow again. So it's like snowing Weather Channel inside. And you know, the creative director was like, you're a freak, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is great. But they but, loved it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but he never said, oh, this guy would be a great copywriter. Like right. it, it just didn't translate. And right. I would always kind of do that to it. But to answer your question, I, it was nice because I had these kind of high intensity, short bursts of work, got enough money to get me through a two or three weeks where I could really focus on writing. And, and that's how I just plugged along for a while until something broke. And going back to the leave behinds, can you remember any of ones that are like some of your most creative productions? Because the one you described as cool, is anything else <laughs> yeah. that beats that one? Cause you I'm got me because I obviously <laughs> picked the best one. <laughs> Thanks, Amani. But um, <laughs> no, it was things like I always kind of tied it into obviously whatever you're pitching. We pitched Starbucks once and I did a I did some sort of like Colombian bean sack with it had beans in it. Like it was it was always this. I'm sure these, you know, it was Howard Schultz. He right. You know, and I'm sure he was like, <laughs> thanks. Like, what am I going to do with this thing? You know, but it was fun for me. And I, I was never in the room or anything. I was asleep in a car while they were uh. actually pitching and you know, sleeping it off. But um, the, one of the funnest ones was we went to uh, went to New York City to pitch Levi's, who's based in San Francisco, so I don't know why we went to New York. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I think it was Levi's. And um, I got to do sort of a billboard of just, like, jeans in history. So anything I could do. So it was like like a collage kind of thing. So it wasn't the most creative thing, but it was that's what they wanted. So I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to really nail it. So I went down to the village, and I, I went into a record store on Bleecker Street, and I, I found, like, a vintage copy of uh, Sticky Fingers, that Warhol with the okay. jeans and the zipper. Right. Like, this is perfect. And by the way, when we're done with the thing, I'm going to hang on to yes, this record. I'm going to keep it. So it had a little, little, I had a little kind of perks here and there. But it was really fun. It was a, it was a great, weird, out-of-the-box, literally creative kind of exercise every time. So it's nice. Now, growing up, and maybe past and current, what were what are some of your favorite sitcoms? Oh wow, um, I was a huge Simpsons fan, like huge. And uh, in fact, I was back in when I moved to San. I think it started in '89. That's how long that show's been on. Like three <laughs> predicting or, the future. Three, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> unfortunately, and uh, so yeah, I mean, I used to videotape that thing, not yeah. knowing that someday <laughs> there'll be DVDs you can buy VHS. on Amazon. Were you, you know? on VHS or VHS. Beta? VHS, <laughs> <laughs> not Beta. I was a little past that. I'm not All right, good, good. And, uh, but um, yeah, so I would just and I would rec I would write down in tiny type. I could maybe fit thirteen episodes on that little thing. Um, but I love that, and um, my you know I love Seinfeld. I love all the ones that you know the weird ones. I love stuff like that. And just that's my vibe for sure. <laughs> 
when did you when were you finally able to walk away from advertising full time? When was kind of the turning point when you said, OK, I'm going to do my writing full time. We're off and running. Let's do this. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was in L.A. working at uh, mostly BBDOS, like I said, and I was doing these, you know, TV spec scripts, which are, you know, just existing shows. You write your version of it and you send oh, it out to writing sample. Okay. So I had to. You know, I had a Friends and a Frasier and all these ones. And, you know, I had a Simpsons, which I was really proud of. And I can't believe no one ever hired me because it was brilliant. But, um, There's still a chance. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll never go away. <laughs> but, yeah, so I, I was kind of getting, I had an agent at that point. My guy who got me drunk and tricked me into doing this long since gave up on it. His wife pulled him back to San Francisco. So I was on my own, but still loving doing it. But I was getting a little burned. I had an agent who wasn't that big of an agent. She was in the Valley and it was kind of comical. But she was trying. She was trying to help me. But nothing was really sticking, and uh, so I just wanting to do something a little different. I said, "Well, why don't I try a screenplay?" And I, you know, so I read Sid Field's books. I was a big movie buff. I loved movies, and but it never occurred to me to do. I knew people wrote screenplays somehow, but not TV. Like TVs were magic; it just happened, <laughs> or the actors just made it up. But um, you know, I'd never really read a screenplay before. I loved the movie that was out then. It was one of the early independent wave movies called Swingers. Yeah. And uh, it was my favorite movie. Beautiful, it's, beautiful baby. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> movie. And the way the dialogue snapped, I was like, oh yeah. my, this is so great. And then I went to a bookstore and I found, I didn't know that they printed, you could buy the screenplay of the, oh. the way it was shot. And I read that 10 times. I'm like, I got this. Yeah, I can do this. So I had a romantic comedy idea and I wrote it. It was called Buying the Cow, which immediately tells you I didn't know what I was doing because it's the worst <laughs> title ever. Never use a gerund in your title. Okay, okay. good and, lesson. Uh, yeah, so I wrote it, and I mean, it's a, I could give you more details of how the path of how it happened, but within a year or two, it was bought, greenlit, and the guy who I'd started hanging out with, who was an aspiring director from UCLA, who kind of helped me tighten it up, they let him direct it and me co-produce it. So it was like, my first shot at this and which was a curse i'm not bragging i mean i'll tell you about that too but so yeah so that was the script that i was printing out revisions on at the mailroom of the advertising agency also caused me to go bye i'm sorry right. and so i wasn't like i had to quit because i was freelance but i just kind of stopped yeah. returning calls and i never looked back i never worked at an ad agency ever again that was back in 2000, correct? Yeah, it got, we, I think we sold it around 99, which is when my first son was born, too. So it was a crazy, crazy time. And uh, it, got, it got made into, we shot it in 2000. And this company was insane. They were called Destination Films. I can talk about them because they're no longer with us. <laughs> and the reason is they don't, they're brand new and they, they bought a space like right on Santa Monica overloading the ocean. We used to go to these production meetings and we were glad, it was like, Gordon Gecko, like you're looking out over the Pacific and, you know, like, wow, they must have deep pockets. I think one of the guys was Amish and he had some Amish money or okay, something. Okay. And uh, Krugels or something. And so, yeah, we were, you know, they, and they bought a box at Staples. They did all the things you don't do when you're starting out. Like, you know, Miramax at the time didn't have a box right. at Staples, but they were just going for it. And they had two films that came out before us, which I, if I could remember them, you'd recognize them, but they were quick. So meanwhile, they're giving, we were the lowball one. We were, a, you know, middle, you know, budgeted romantic comedy. And, you know, they, they did testing. They, we had test audiences out in Hermosa Beach with real audiences. And we'd find out what was missing and what was wrong. And they'd go, well, here's, here's another million. Why don't you go redo the ending? And we're like, what the hell? So we won't surprise you to learn how the story ends. Right. right as we were supposed to come out with the movie, they went bankrupt. Ugh. And... It, but it was such a ride. It was a year and a half of making the movie and everything. And um, they sold it to MGM and MGM cut their losses. And in like 2002, it went out direct to video. Okay. But it was my first foray. It got made greenlit. I got to hang out on the set, which was a stupid thing to do as a writer. I didn't know that. But I'm like, <laughs> oh, I want to hang out in case they need a line change. I'm here. I'm, I'm the fixer. And, uh, but it gave me this false impression that, oh, I got this. I right. can do this, which turned out not to be the case. So yeah. tell us, why was it a curse? Well, the curse of that was it made it seem so easy. And, yeah. you know, if I'm being honest with myself, it made me think, I, you know, wow, <laughs> you know. But like anything in this town, things are fluky. You have to be lucky. You have to do the work and do it well. I mean, someone liked the screenplay enough to do it, and they got, we got some good act. We had Jerry O'Connell, Ryan Reynolds, like Bill Bellamy at the time, Alyssa Milano. Like, so we got good yeah. people on the movie. Right. And, uh, but you know, it made me kind of feel like, no, I can, 
I can hang out on the set and I'll work with, you know, and I'll be here for it. But I really just loved being around it when I should have been home working on the writing, next one. You yeah. always got to keep writing if that's what you want to do. You know, do you want to be a director? Go do that. But if you're a writer, what the hell are you doing <laughs> standing around the craft service table right. wondering what's for lunch? And um, so that's kind of what I learned the hard work of years. And I, uh, yeah, it was a tough lesson. And I just realized you got to keep at it. Like that's, and if that's not what you want to do, then do something else. But, True. Yeah. So 2002, it's fine. Go straight to DVD back then. Mm -hmm. What happened between 2002 to 2007? Because then Roe called you about a job, right. and that's when you started Herbert's Wormhole. Yeah, that kind of was my foray into book writing. And between then, um, this this crazy guy I met, Roatash, who you've interviewed. Yes. Yes. And. Uh, he, I met in, in, at BBDO, and we, we hit it off. I mean, the, while I'm printing out scripts, I heard some music <laughs> upstairs, and it's like 11 at night, and he's in the editing bay, like, looking like I just caught him, <laughs> you know, with someone's wife, and he's, he's in there editing his documentary or whatever, and we right. kind of looked at each other like, okay, I know you, yeah, I know you. <laughs> so we became friends, but not super tight, and I think he moved to New York at the time, whatever he had. We both kind of, you know, went our ways, and... Uh, you know, after buying the cow, I you know I did a couple things. I sold a script to DreamWorks that didn't get made, but it made. It, I always had enough work to keep an agent around. I got a better agent, things like that. Um, and again, my second kid came around at this time, and uh, I was sort of shifting into the Mr. Mom mode, but still writing, but not super going at it. Um, and you know, by the time my first kid was getting to be about six seven eight and wondering what do you do for a living daddy because you're always hanging out with me um i thought my god like when he gets old enough i'm gonna say i write movies or what, what movies and i don't want to show him <laughs> buying the cow or national lampoon's <laughs> van wilder right. that I worked on and i'm like okay so i and also i was kind of in that kid mode excuse me and um so i thought well i should write a you know a kid's animated feature I could do that. I have that mindset anyway of back when I was playing, I'm making up games with my brothers. I, yeah. you, know, you always tap into everything. Everything's <laughs> yeah. useful. And uh, so I started working on one and I had a pretty good idea about two kids next door neighbors who really couldn't stand each other. They were total opposites, but their mothers put them on forced play dates. Um, but one of them was sort of this genius. One kid was a gamer. One kid was this genius inventor and he found a wormhole to, to travel time through. So it was sort of like play date 2000. 2109 and play date 33 BC and I'm like this could be a franchise where they go and play dates mm -hmm. of different things and I'm kind of working on the first one and trying to get it together and Ro calls me from New York where he's just started at Sci-Fi which is owned by I don't know Comcast or one mm -hmm. of those what things and he said they also own you know it was either Cartoon Network or something like that and he said uh, I know it's been a while and we haven't worked together, he goes, but I hate it here. And I want to do something. And one of the guys I met who works for the, car, the animated TV kids network, uh, they're looking for animated series. Do you have any kids ideas? And I'm like, yeah, I'm working on this. And so he's like, screw the movie. Come on, man, we got to do this. So he had it in. So he and a producer from New York came out west. And we switched the movie over to a pitch book for a TV show. Just made some changes to it. The concept was the same. And... Uh, we went out and we got passed everywhere. Nickelodeon, the Disney, all the places. They liked it enough, but whatever. And so that was it. And I said, okay, they went back to New York. I went back to turn it back into a screenplay and it'll be fine. Well, and this, Ro and I disagree on how the story goes down, <laughs> but I swear I have the right version. Um, so unbeknownst to me, this producer said, you know, before we hang this up, I know someone at HarperCollins who, it's worth a shot. What do you say we go into this person, uh, Brenda Bowen, who owns a, she has a division, a, a, an imprint at Harper for children's books, and let's just see what she thinks. The book is, you know, you could pitch this TV thing as a book. She could right. get the idea. So Rose said, he told me later, he said, well, shouldn't we call Pete or have him fly out? And I don't know if this producer was like, I was the dud in the room or what, <laughs> but he's like, you know what, let's not tell Pete. <laughs> because if we, she says no, he doesn't need to get bummed out again. Right. And if he says yes, she says yes, he's, we're going to make his day. <laughs> so they did that. And I will never forget where I was because as a New Englander, I was at uh, Super Bowl 39, I think it was. It was the undefeated Patriots season oh, when they lost the to Giants. the Giants yes. in Arizona. And I was there with my wife. It was in the morning and we were getting ready to go to the game and my phone rings and I answer it and I hear Ro on speaker, this producer and this woman, I'd never, didn't know her voice, but they were clearly drunk 
and it was probably noon there. <laughs> and they're like, hey, hey, you don't know me. I just go to it. I'm like, what do you guys want? And going, I know you go to the Super Bowl, but how would you like to write a children's book? And I was like, okay. You know, so it was, as a sports fan, it was the worst day of my life that started <laughs> out pretty good. It just yeah. got bad. But it was a really funny surprise, and it completely... At a time where I was like, what am I really doing here? What's my next move? Screenplays, TV. And it just put me on this new path of, wow, this is a whole different thing I can do. Different agents in New York. It's a whole other world. And uh, yeah, that got us through a, a three book series followed by we pitched a four book series. So over the last, literally it just came out this past Christmas was our final book of our last series. Probably it was seven books over seven or eight years that we worked on. We did right. other stuff in between, but right. yeah, it really just put us, Ro and I, on a total path. He moved out here, like right. we just took, went with it. So, so although they lost, I mean, let's let's keep uh, it all in perspective. The Patriots have won what five Super Bowls <laughs> since since '99 or whatever, 2000. We're, we're spoiled, but we were also <laughs> really cursed before that. So, so it's, it's, you know, me, I'm a Washington fan, so now okay. we're in the we're in the valley. Now we need to get back to the peak. So mm -hmm. let's keep it all in perspective. Never give up. That's the theme. <laughs> this kids. is true. In your opinion, what is important for creative professionals such as yourself and myself to succeed in today's business environment? Uh, in general, just any creative, I think it is um, being able to be malleable with whatever you're doing. If you're a musician or a poet or an actor or whatever, all that's great and to be creative is wonderful. The minute you want someone to give you a dollar for it, it really changes it a little bit. And it should. You're asking someone to invest or buy or do whatever. And for me, I think when that happens, you have to sort of accept. And it's really tough because you can slip either way. If you, if you try to kind of say, you know what, this is my vision, whatever, you don't understand it. You might be one of those people who the world catches up with you and you've kept your you know, perfect and never, you get all this money. But if you go too far the other direction where you're like, well, I need to sell this, so my idea is too weird or it's too something, I'm going to really go for the next, what's, what's mm -hmm. hot right now, you're also going to be chasing something you'll never catch. So for me, it's really tricky to stay in that middle ground where you stay true to your vision and your, what you're doing, but you have to be a little open to, hey, if someone wants to invest in this, you know, it's almost a partnership where I should maybe think about what can I do to make it more people come buy a ticket right. or more, whatever. And I think that's an important thing, and it's really hard for people to learn, especially if you're a staunchly creative person. <laughs> and, you know, if you're a musician, you can sit in your room and play guitar, and you're a musician, you know? Uh, I could write stuff and put on puppet shows in the mirror, you know? I could do that, and I'm doing my thing. But if I want to get paid for it, you have to, I think, and this rubs people the wrong way, but I think you have to be malleable. And the, th the way you can get away with it is sometimes when you do that, it opens a door you didn't see. Exactly. You know? you can, oh wow, because I was so, this is my thing about, you know, a witch who owns a ruler and has to do this, and that's what it is, if no one gets it, screw them. But what if, you know, what if we made it this or that, or you open it up, and there's, you know, possible, the, the reason it's more popular is for a reason, which is it's more universal, and a lot, that's not a bad thing in writing or any creative endeavor. True. Since you spoke about being malleable, how would you define yourself in 30 seconds, or summarize yourself in 30 seconds, knowing how you must be malleable. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I am lazy but lucky in a lot of ways. <laughs> okay. And I, I mean, that's, that's not a very inspirational way to put it. <laughs> I've, I, I was, like I said, I was late coming into this stuff. I, for whatever reason, I either didn't realize, you know, the thing you opened with about the story when I was nine and the thing. And I mean, I, I knew I was a writer and people told me, you're a good writer growing up and stuff, but I never thought either I was good enough or that that was a thing I could really do. And uh, so, you know, I kind of was a late bloomer that way. And what that meant was I sort of went with the flow. Like I got into graphic design of all things, what the <laughs> hell? So I was always sort of just like, as things came along, that looks interesting. I'm gonna go over there and do that for a while. You know, I didn't really hear that ticking clock of you should work on this, you should do that. And there's no reason, I didn't, I'm the oldest, so I didn't have older siblings to see, oh, that's, you, that's how you do it or that's how you don't do it. I was just sort of drifting along is better than lazy, I guess. And the malleableness of that, you know, as a lifestyle, as the way I got creative, was bad in that had I known this is where I would be, I should have, you know, when I drove across the country, I should have wrote a book about that or something. But I was just looking at the sunsets and <laughs> camping every night with a woman I loved, and this is great. I don't need to, you know, use it. I, my memory's kind of shot, so unfortunately I can't go back too much. But I, uh, you know, it, it allows you to kind of, it. you just sort of, 
I found my way eventually. The good part, and maybe you know, I could have gotten more done or been better at my craft now had I figured it out earlier. But the good part about it is, being malleable that way, is you open yourself up and you're, you're kind of aware of things. I see different walks of life. I've done other things. If I just like got out of college and ran to Hollywood, I'd be writing movies about being a screenwriter. You know, like it's, there, you just kind of live a life a little bit more. I lived in different places. I've traveled, I've done things like that. So that's kind of a malleableness in the lifestyle that lead that gives you breadth as for material you yeah. know and it, i think it's a good thing it's it's a trade-off you know yeah. who knows where it would have been but like, you know, like, no complaints they say life experience gives you an advantage so ah, you cool. have an advantage That's true <laughs> why do you love what you do oh wow um why do i love what i do um i've always had characters in my head stories in my head um, I've always been able to like, I've always observed people and even little, I used to watch, I could, I could watch people and I would make up scenes in my head about them. It's really remarkable. I didn't figure out that people wrote for TV <laughs> <laughs> early before I was 22, <laughs> but I, um, I, that's, that's what I love about it is, ta is it's a place to park all that weird stuff that I've had. And it's not special to me. A lot of people can do that and do do that and don't write because of it, but just, you know, enjoy that kind of thing. And, uh, I, I love that I can put that stuff in different places. I've, you know, I've done TV, I've done animation, I've done shorts, I've done movies, I've done books, and there's a place for a lot, there's a lot of places to park things. And now there's YouTube and there's all these other yeah. places you can do stuff, there's all these other channels and things you can do. So it's not just selling, I don't mean it that way, I mean it's a, it's a place for your ideas to go live, because otherwise they're just in your head, you know? And I love, I love getting them, putting them on a page or putting them out there or seeing them on a screen because like they're alive now and it's crazy. It, giving birth to something that you thought of and seeing it. And then the, the corollary, corollary to that is, sorry, is seeing people react to that. Right. Whether it's being in a, that test audience and watching, you know, seeing an audience of people laugh at a joke you wrote or seeing an actor you kind of dig read one of your lines and crack up and have to do it again like it's just such a great feeling or to get be in a in an auditorium full of little kids who are raising their hands asking questions about my book that stump me because they remember they know the book <laughs> i wrote it two years ago and, and their excitement in it or getting fan mail from kids and stuff it's just the to, to give birth to ideas and then to see those ideas give birth to creation or cre creativity in other people or just get a reaction or emotional response it's just this sort of universe thing that you plug into and it's just, it's intoxicating. Now we spoke about back in the day, the VHS tapes, oh God. and now we've seen things progress so fast to where it's like on demand, things coming out, the whole series are launched on Netflix or Amazon and like, you know, you have 12 or 14 episodes. Yeah. What's been your opinion on the evolution of TV and film? I think it's amazing. I think it's really great. As a, as a consumer and a creator, I think it's awesome. I mean, I agree. Where my <laughs> my youngest, probably two. I'm not going to say his age because people will judge me. Son and I and my wife just started. Like we'd already watched Breaking Bad, but we started watching it uh, last week. And there, it's just amazing that you can just sit there and watch these things, and it gives you such breadth as far as you can really get into every character. You can get just go deeper with that the good stuff, you know. Whereas if Breaking Bad was a movie. I'll just use an example. You wouldn't know like Tuco had an uncle and like his backstory, you know, but if you have all these episodes, you can just delve into yeah. everything and it just goes out. And when it's, you know, there are some that get off the reservation and they just didn't, um, you know, they didn't rein it in. But if it's in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing, it's amazing. As a, as a creator, it, there's so many more places to try to do what I was just saying I got my nut off about, which is like get, get your stuff out there. Right. There's more places to plug in. Yeah. And uh, it's really exciting time, I think, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Definitely agree. Kind of on the flip side, what scares you? Um, that I suck, <laughs> that I'll never have a good idea again. I'm a writer, so I suck. Like you go in the Writers Guild, there's a plaque that says, you suck. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a writer's thing. I mean, I don't care how successful you are, you think you suck sometimes at least. And uh, it's hard. It's, it's a, even with the best of intentions, the best of circumstances, writing partners, whatever, it's an, it's an isolating process. And you have an idea, and only you have an idea. And that's exciting, but it's also terrifying. And you try to write it, and you're going to have those moments of, what the hell am I doing? This is so stupid. Or this has been done before. What am I, you know, this isn't right. And 
that can be crippling. Um, and that's what you fear all the time. Every time you sit down and you look at a blank screen or page, what if it doesn't come this time? You know, there's this feeling, maybe it's because I'm in my, I just entered my 50s recently. Uh, you're like, what if it's finite? I'm funny, I can write, I know I make people, what, what, what if one day I'm just like, eh, I don't have anything, you know, I'm out, I'm done. But you realize that's not how it works. You know, right. you, you, you put stuff into the machine, like you said, experience and stuff, and it comes out the other end where you're just like, okay, um, this is a funny take on what I saw, what I did, and you know, it never goes away. But you, you have that irrational fear sometimes, yeah. and it can get you, you get overcome it. For someone who's gotten their stamp of approval from J.K. Rowling, oh, geez. but still feels like they suck at times, <laughs> how would you give someone maybe who's a little bit younger in their career, kind of trying to follow in your footsteps, advice so that they too can get through it like you've gotten through it many times? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but for a reason, it's chop the wood. Like, you have to do the work. I mean, it's, you know, there's so many... You know, it's a little different if you're talking about writing books or, or writing for, you know, Hollywood or whatever. But, um, you know, in the film and TV side, there's so much, you know, networking and moving around and pitching and stuff that you feel like you just got to ride that wave. But at the end of the day, you can take a million meetings. You got to go home and write the thing. Mm-hmm. You got to write the thing. And, yeah, then you have to get out and sell it and, you know, try to promote it because there's su- such a glut of other people doing it. But um, that's what you have to do. And then the other side of it is the networking. And uh, again, it goes hand in hand. You gotta be good at both. I am not, I don't like networking. I don't <laughs> like pitching. I'm one of those guys who, I mean, I've always kind of been able to crack people up. So people tell me, oh, you should be a stand-up comic or go to Hollywood. You know, my buddies again in Massachusetts, right. hey, hey, it's Hollywood. What are you doing in Hollywood? How's it going out there? But, um, you know, I, I just, it's, it's flattering when people think I should be doing that, but it's not me. I don't, you know, yeah. the, the one thing I got away with doing was on some of our animated stuff um, for Comedy Central. We were low budget when we did the first one and we were coming in late and I could, tell, I could expand on the story, but basically the producer was like, this idea you guys have for an animated half hour is really funny. We tried to pitch it to Adult Swim, it didn't go. And this producer was like, you know, I have this show on Comedy Central called Trip Tank. Yes. And it's just a series of two minute shorts. Take the pitch, can you guys do one of these? You can, we'll put you on the season. And we're like, great. He's like, okay, the bad news is there's 12 other people who are gonna be on the same show with you because they're little two minute cut ups. And it's big time directors, it's all good. You know, it's, it's really an interesting concept. Um, They've had a year to do theirs. You have 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, we can do this. We got it. So, and we got it. And the th- because of that, I got to kind of do some voice character racing on, characters on it. And that was, that was like, that scratched my itch of my performing because no <laughs> one could see me. I was in a little studio like this with the headphones on. <laughs> and it worked out. Um, but I guess that's kind of to get back all the way back is uh, you have to kind of you have to kind of shuck and jive a little and like work on your stuff, get as good as it can be, but then have that pitch to it as well. Even with book books, you have to pitch a book series to a publisher. You have to give them a synopsis, a query letter. You have to maybe sometimes write the first five chapters right. just on spec, which is a lot of writing. Yeah. And you're hoping someone gets it. Um, and you have to get in a room too and really talk about it. And um, so I guess the advice would be don't let either one of those outshadow the other because you've got to do them both and you've got to do them both well. Good advice. You spoke about the glut of writers out here in the world, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Your industry is a quite a crowded space. What do you do? How do you rise above all the noise and competition and distinguish yourself? Um, it's kind of that thing of what I just said, like really doing the work, like getting the work done. But to really stand out, it's, I think, surrounding yourself with people who are there to support you and help you, whether they're partners actually doing it or just people who are like, go because it can really grind you down. And um, you, can't, you can't give up, but you have to be realistic too. So it sort of harkens back to a few of the things I've already said, like about, you know, don't be afraid to make it a little commercial. Don't be too precious with your stuff. Um, share your ideas with people. For years, I was like, if I had a joke in my head, I wouldn't say it out loud mm. in case someone heard me in a coffee shop and used it. It's like <laughs> such a rookie move. Like, get over yourself, you know? Someone's going, oh, I got a good one. I heard it today, coffee bean. <laughs> So it's just those little lessons of, um, of doing the work and, and, and just and networking, but in a way where you're around good people, not just powerful people or big people or whatever. Right. You, have to, you have to be, because you can't always go to the well of inspiring yourself all the time. You, it's, don't be afraid to collaborate, and I mean that working-wise, but also in just leaning on people who can kind of help you with that and push you through the tough times. Yeah. It gets tough. 
I couldn't agree more. How have you been able to surround yourself with good people consistently? Um, well, I don't know about consistently, but <laughs> it is L.A. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Tons of good people. No, no. I, I am not a fan of bashing L.A. I think that's a stupid sport. Um, you know, you, you just kind of, you got to be an open person, I think. You got to be a nice person, a likable person, and, y you know, you'll attract that same kind of person back, I think. And I've been very lucky with family and my wife and my friends and um it's and you also meet like-minded people out here obviously like i you know i i wasn't with the cool kids at advertising but you know enough or i i met ro you know exactly. it really changed my life mm -hmm. um and if you're if you're you know working on certain things you're working on a sitcom you're going to meet other people who are doing that and sometimes you tend to be like oh it's a competition it's like no you got to get in there and meet these people because you will inspire each other and i think that's a big part of it is just being open um being honest and you know that's that's part of networking too is just you know being friendly with people and talk what are you working on you know yeah. it's it's a, it's a thing you kind of it's a cliche of how people in LA say well it's your project but <laughs> no it's kind of it's a it's a community of people doing really cool stuff and you should embrace that and be proud to be part of it yeah how do you get over the competition kind of game because I know a lot of people are afraid as you were when you were younger sure. to share what you're working on because you're afraid someone might steal your idea or just competition how have you gotten through that I think it's um having confidence in yourself and having sort of faith in humanity. Like not everyone's a dick. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, get over yourself. Your ideas aren't so great that they're like gotta be at Fort Knox, you know? So it's, uh, it, yeah, you just sort of, it, it, the competition can be kind of invigorating too. You know, when something goes well, you feel like, wow, this is a tough town and I did X, Y, or Z or this person liked my stuff or, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's, or I got an agent or, you know, whatever. It's, uh, you, can, you can use it to your advantage. When you're not getting stuff and you're thinking, it's, it can be a, a crutch to say, well, it's so competent, you know, it's, mm -hmm. people aren't even looking at my stuff because I don't have the name or whatever. And so you can kind of rationalize things too. But I think you have to just um, embrace what you're doing, have faith in your own voice, you know, but be honest with yourself. You know, is my stuff, how is it, you know, how can I improve? You know, don't blame the industry. If, you know, do your best work, put it out there, and let the competition be the competition and get in the fight. Nice. Very self-aware answer. I like it. Thanks. How has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Yeah, the um, sort of the situation I alluded to earlier where I sold that screenplay. <laughs> because it's so damn easy here in this town, <laughs> was uh, set me up for that failure, and I alluded it to, which is, you know, I, by the time I went to the, the well again to really do my next thing, I came up with this, actually it was Ro's idea, I was with him at that point, on and off, and he had this idea, as often we do when we work together, he'll come up with this zany just idea, and let's go shoot it in the basement over two days. And I'm like, whoa, 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 let's see where this leads. And I try to branch it out and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, what if uh, someone moved into a house and turned on their garden hose and it was spring, it was pulling from the well of the fountain of youth. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. So I said, can I mess around with that a little? And he's like, yeah, it's yours, <laughs> have fun. So I went away and I wrote this screenplay, which I thought was like my next big thing. I'd done a couple, like I told you, I got some rewrite gigs here and there after buying the cow and Van Wilder and all this stuff. And but um, I was like, no, this is the next move for me. And it was this sort of, I don't know what I was thinking. It was this gothic set in Florida, because Fountain of Youth, old house thing where um, there was a prison, like there was a Shawshanky, Green Mile, like magical vibe attached where there's a prison nearby, but all the inmates were actually young. How could they be young? And it was this <laughs> dark, weird thing. There was a kid involved. So you're like, was it for kids or grow? like it was really all over the map but at the time I was like no one gets this kind of gets back to the thing like you know smell your own shit kinda, you know <laughs> but I was so proud of it and good and no one got it I think even Ro was like okay all right let's take it out he was nice <laughs> he was a good solid partner and, and I did that and just no one got it and people were either politely quiet about it or just didn't return calls and it really hurt because I I put my heart and soul into it and I I, by doing that, I think I overthought it. I was so complicated that I'm sure people just didn't know what to make of it. And that was a straight up failure. But what I learned was you don't set it on fire and throw it off Mulholland Drive. Like you put it in your, you put it in your you know, drawer right. and you never throw anything away. And that's an important lesson too because, God, how many years later, when we sold our second 
book, children's book idea to HarperCollins. It was this concept called Creature Keepers. Yes. It's out now, Amazon. Yes. And, um, <laughs> we'll link it in the show notes. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, it's about cryptids. It's Loch Ness Monster and Yeti and all those guys. And it's a kid's book, you know, grades three to seven, whatever. But we needed this one element that we couldn't come up with. And something clicked, and I went back to that script. And that fountain of youth was like, just fit perfectly nice. in the puzzle. It was the last piece <laughs> of the puzzle. So it was that thing where whatever failure you have in whatever you're doing, whether you wrote a song that everyone hates or whatever it is, you know, just hold on to it because you can poach from yourself. No one's going to bust you. And you, there's got to be something in there that maybe it went off the rails, but there was something in there, the Rose idea, of course, the, <laughs> the garden hose founder of you, right. that you took and ruined. But you can go back and you can pull that out and you can use it again. And it really made all the difference. So a failure's a failure in the short term, but it can also really help you, you know. Now you've written several movies, several successful children's books as well. So your, your name is out there. Mm -hmm. How do you handle your critics or your haters as we like to call them? Mm. I don't, you're very kind, but I don't have enough credit where I have that many critics. But of course, you know, stuff has come across before and uh, the short answer is I don't, but as far as handle them, as far as sort of the reaction internally I get, um, you know, I let it beat me up a little. I let it come and I roll with it and, you know, just tell myself I suck for a day or two and then I get back to work. And there was, uh, on one of the books, there was a pretty important children's book critic that's online that a lot of moms and librarians read to find. And it was such a mean one because they started out like this, you know, they're really explaining when this kid goes down to Florida and this happens, you'll never guess what happens. And then the second paragraph was like, this book is an invitation to snooze. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just like, why did you mm -hmm. open, why didn't you open with that? I would have stopped. <laughs> like they just lead, let me in. And it was kind of a bummer and it got me down and, you know, and that was maybe the first book of a series I had to write. And I'm like, okay, this could cripple me. I now, I still have, four years of right. work on this series. And if this is going to be in my head, I'm doomed. So I, I let it ride, but it, it, I was sweating for a little bit because it was, it was a reputable critic. And I'm like, how am I going to win them back? And that's not how you do it. And what I did was I, I went and pulled out some of the, I don't get a lot, but I get more fan mail than I do critics. So these kids that we go, we go to schools, we do talks, we, yeah. you know, or sometimes kids just send it to New York and they find us and we get these letters from these great kids who, you know, just think we're the bomb, you know, <laughs> and they draw the pictures and they pitch us like what the next book should be about in the series using the characters. And I'm like, okay. you know what, I'm going to listen to that, not yes. the other guy. Yes. And uh, that helps a lot. But I will say sometimes you do get criticism from, you know, people you admire, respect, or should listen to. And uh, we had a librarian, the librarians, okay? If you're ever gonna write a book, don't piss off your librarians. <laughs> they are, they are me they can really come against you. They're unionized, you don't wanna mess with them. <laughs> and we were at a school and we did a reading, I think, and uh, this librarian, she came up to me afterwards and she said, I love your series, it's really great. The kids love them, They're, I can't keep them on the shelves, all that nice stuff. And she said, I'm just wondering why you don't have any diversity in the characters, people of color, and I, I never occurred to me, which is the problem, it doesn't occur to you. Mm. And she was totally right, and I said, I, I said exactly that, it just didn't occur to me, and that's not an excuse, that's the problem. And she's like, something to think about, <laughs> good luck. And I ran back to Rob like, God, we gotta, can you, we gotta get this guy. But then you didn't wanna force it, but right. it, was, it, was a, it, was, it was a correct thing, it was just that perspective of, how you know certain kids in the country to see or hear a character that looks like them yes. is so important. Yes. And I really, it did bum me out, but not in the way of the mean person who said it was an invitation right. to snooze. snooze. It, was, it was, gosh, how did I not think of that? It's such a rare responsibility to, to have books in kids' hands, you know, to not think of that and kind of you know, use that and make it work. So we made some adjustments. So you just have to take the good with the bad and try to ignore the bad if you can. Good. Made some adjustments and kept it moving. Right on. That's good. Tell us about the darkest time in your life, how you got through that, and what did you learn from that experience? Right. Um, I, I don't know if I'm in denial but, or just oddly blessed, but I, I don't have a lot of really dark, knock on wood, yes. um, dark stories in my life. I mean, I may be bracing for like, it's all <laughs> gonna come in 2019 or something, but, um, you know, obviously I've, I've had my share of things that have gone wrong. I, probably the darkest was uh, a family member, very, very close to me, had a real problem with addiction. Mm -hmm. And it was a few years ago, a number of years ago, 
and you know for whatever reason I was sort of the hub he, he doesn't live in LA lives sort of far away but for whatever reason his friends girlfriend the family my immediate family all came through me because he was off the charts off the grid and uh, it was really stressful and worrying and you know I couldn't smile during that time which is odd for me I've always been sort of a happy-go-lucky thinking of weird stuff and this was just devastating to me and uh, you know I couldn't reach him all the time when I could it was when he tried to pull it together and just he would lie to me which he'd never done before it's all those awful things you hear about when people are facing addiction they'll just lie to you know the people they love the most and it crushed me and I'm on deadline for a book so I'm, I'm off the phone okay hope you're okay I got to hear his voice but I know it's gonna be another three days and I don't know what's gonna happen or how bad this might get And now I gotta go write about a kid mm. playing with a Yeti mm. you know and <laughs> it it was very difficult um, he's fine now by the way everything worked out he's been clean for since then and sober f for years and he's you know he's great and he's one of my heroes for having gotten through that and the strength to pull out of it but I um, I learned from that that it's not like compartmentalizing and it's not like I could use those experiences in a kid's book but there was a thing where to use your art to just kind of turn off that stuff and just throw yourself back into it it doesn't mean you're not caring or indifferent it just means you're human too and you need to take a break and you put yourself into it and I did and it was something that I realized if I can do that if I can write under these circumstances then what am I complaining about when I get up and I'm like, oh, I need to go to the gym. I don't think I'm going to write today. It's like, right, mofo, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, and it, the, the kind of tail end of that story was when I was done with that particular book, I dedicated it to him. And he, um, it meant a lot to him. I, it was never explicitly said, but I, I think he didn't remember a lot of the stuff that was said. And when he read that, he sort of realized, oh, you were the person who was sort of the hub of everything. Mm -hmm. I never mentioned it again. I never talked to him about like how bad it was for everyone. It was not not his burden to bear. Um, but I, you know, I could tell that he got it and understood and appreciated it, and that was enough for me. You know, great story. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Who was the most influential person for you growing up? Um, that would be persons, and it would be my two younger brothers I okay. mentioned earlier. Yeah, and they. Uh, they, you know, again, I, they were older than me in a lot of ways, which is kind of, it's not creepy, but it's weird. And, uh, but they were always just my partners in crime with the stuff that ended up like feeding into my career. So it was like the TV we watched, like Bugs Bunny cartoons and Monty Python and Benny Hill and just the stuff that made us all get real twisted, you know, and they more than anyone, aside from my wife, they're my best friends, first of all. And more than anyone, they share my sensibilities and humor. I mean, they helped form it. You know, <laughs> I mean, when I say I was, I was putting on these elaborate fantasy games, and you know, it wasn't just me. And they were, I mean, they were like, oh, you know, they were part of it. Like we were in the world of imagination, and it really helped. And as we got older, as I was sort of lazy but lucky, drifting toward what I should be doing, as the oldest kid, kind of feeling maybe like. I'm not, you know, that's not a valid thing to do, to write or get in the creative world, go into advertising or whatever. They were off becoming musicians, going to Berklee College of Music, wow, my middle nice. brother, Sean. My youngest brother, um, you know, studied acting and went to New York City to be an actor. And they're doing it out of college or in college. Right. And I'm looking at them. Like, I'm supposed to inspire you guys. What's going on here? <laughs> Look at them, and they're, they're not dicking around. Right. And I think it dovetailed with, you know, as I was getting tugged on the sleeve by the universe, right, dummy? I'm like, yeah, mm. you got you to gotta answer that phone. You yes. got to do it. And they've, they've always been there for me. And, I mean, God love them. My parents, blue collar, neither of them went to uh, college. My mother was a secretary. My father was an electrician, still is. And they raised a, an actor, a musician, <laughs> and a writer. And they're just like... You know, how creative was the, the mailman? That's Jeez, beautiful. What's going on there? You know? what's, what's, what's the story here? But they're so proud of us in that way. And so, yeah, my brothers and I were just, we're kind of one in the same. We just have these perfectly split and we share ideas about what it means to be creative. Some of the stuff I touched on, I, have, I know to talk to you about because I've had these conversations with them for yeah. hours about commercial art, meaning you're doing your thing for you, but oh, I want to get paid and, you know, and just that angst and all that kind of stuff. It's so nice to have them have started it all in me when we were all little 
and now that I can talk to them and they totally understand what it's like to try to be a creative person. Yeah. I like how you said you got to answer the phone. I like yeah, that. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> now you turned 21. You were at Syracuse still when you turned 21. Yes. So we're going to go back up to upstate New York. Oh, God. We're going to take a visit with Peter at Syracuse and we're going to give you some advice. Knowing what you know now, what would you give your 21 year old self? What advice would you give? Um, to quote, one of my, my favorite show, The Simpsons, is the best quote ever. I'd say, uh, get confident, stupid. Because <laughs> uh, I, was, I was a very cocky person at that age, and I was certainly having a good time. And I was about to head off on the, in the world and make my way, but my way was going to be kind of like wherever the wind blew. And I think I was, uh, you know, it was partly like, oh, I got plenty of time like everyone that age does. But it was probably partly like, I'm, not, I'm scared to really take a chance here. I think in the back of my head, again, I'd had more affirmation beyond that 80s newspaper article. <laughs> in college, I had professors who just would sit me down and be like, you're, what are you doing? Like, you're a natural writer. You should do this. It was really flattering. And, um, but I was like, thanks. You know, that, I'm not going to do that. You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, I would tell that person, you know what? Go on the journeys. Do the things you're doing. Because I, I wouldn't want to curb that. But... Also, like, get the wheels moving because yeah. you've got something here and you can do both. You can chronicle. Like, at least turn on the recorder in your brain and really appreciate what you're doing. And know in the back of your head, someday you are going to be a writer because I'm 50, I'm telling you, here I am. And uh, <laughs> you can use all the stuff. So I think I would just kind of tell myself to sort of, you know, take it more seriously and give it some more thought, you know. And uh, I think I'd be a little closer to some of my goals. But All right. What is the one lesson in life that took you the longest to learn? Oh, similarly, I think it would be, and that's the wrong tense, it's currently still learning. I would say it's um, just to not care so much about what other people think, mm. you know? And um, that's always, for whatever reason, been true in me in general. Um, but certainly as a writer in Hollywood and just, you know, you're constantly trying to outthink or get ahead of what they're going to want to see next and you're working on something that's going to take you months to do so it's an insane prospect to nail it you know <laughs> um so there's that there's just that sort of know who you are and put your best self out there and go with it and some people get it and some people won't and i think it was sort of a pleaser thing where you know you kind of got to keep everyone happy yes. and, make sure, and it's yes. it's it's a tough lesson to learn and i'm getting better but, you know, I think it's something I'll always kind of work on. Yeah. You and me both. How yeah. have, what have you done to get through it and improve even bit by bit? Age, I think. Yeah. yeah. Wisdom. You do. You get older and you get wise and you also get tired. Like, <laughs> it's so tiring. Like, right? Am I right? Like, you, You're correct. It's, it's ridiculous. So you just kind of like, yeah, warts and all, here I am, whatever, you know. And so that's where the laziness kind of helps. Like, you're just like, screw it. Man. Lazy but lucky. Here I am. Yeah. So. Every great person has a sentence. What is your sentence? For example, my sentence would be, I help people unlock their creativity by teaching them how to DJ. Right. What, it, what, what would your sentence be? Oh, man. Um, I would think it would be something like, I, I see the world with, I try to see the world with fresh eyes as much as I can. And then I, ref, I try to reflect that in whatever creative endeavor I'm doing in hopes that it kind of has the same effect on anyone who sees it, reads it, whatever. Well done. Thanks. Well done. What is one new habit you've added to your daily routine in the past year or so that has been most beneficial? Wow. Um, it's so cliche and lame, but it's the only thing. I, I've started exercising again yeah, and eating right. I mean, it sounds like a thing. Oh, New, that's Year's, good. New Year's resolution, <laughs> but it's not very. But it, I, I will say this about that is I always, because I'm one of these up and down guys and stuff, and um, I always, I always forget that when you start, like, you know when you stop and you're kind of just hitting Cheetos and binge watching and yes. Breaking Bad? Yes. It's that downward spiral that gets harder and harder to stop. Well, it works the other way, too. I find when I eat better and I work out, you're kind of, you have more energy. And yes. that absolutely helps with writing and, having, and getting up and wanting to do stuff. So, yeah, it's kind of a cliche, but it's, it's actually working for me. That's a good cliche. We'll take it. Sure. Now, we're really big readers. We're voracious readers here on the Money Experience Podcast. Is there one, two, or three books that you feel people should stop what they're doing right now and start to read them immediately? Wow. Um, I'm not going to say my books. but um, <laughs> That's a given. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are books that I 
for years have sort of read, just a, maybe a few, that I've read, I read sort of, it's time to read this book again. You know, yes. it's almost like a workout or a cleansing or something. Like, for me, like Zen and the Art of Mo Motorcycle Maintenance, which is a pain in the ass, I think, to get through. Uh, Persig, Robert Persig wrote it. And uh, I discovered it in college, like a lot of college kids do. And I go back to it sometimes, and it's a bit of like, okay, it's time to do this. Like, you know. <laughs> And, you know, some Alan Watts stuff and things like that. Um, there's a book I'm reading now, which, I, which is called, um, can I drop F-bombs? You here? can drop F-bombs. Um, the Subtle Art of Giving a Fuck. Of not giving a not fuck. Not giving a fuck, yes. right, of course. Yes. Um, Mark Manson. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I'm sure it's a huge seller. I'm sure people know it. I'm late on all books. I'm like, but no. you're, you're there, though. You're in the and, dance. And, yeah, I started reading it. Someone gave it to my wife, and she's like, read this. And... I love it. I think everyone, everyone probably has. I think it's two million people. It's pretty sure. popular. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, but I think it's great. So if you haven't read it, you should. And it's, it sort of ties in with the Zen thing. Like I'm realizing, oh, there's a pattern. So what's that say about me? But um, it's, for me, it's, I think it's not a self-help book. It is, but it's written wickedly funny. Yes. And it just puts it straight down, like how it works and why you can't fight or you can't just like, grasp at happiness happiness isn't a place that you arrive at it's a it's a verb it's like an action you're working toward it and you can't by saying i've got to become happier that's actually a negative that you're reinforcing that you're, you're working against yourself and i'm getting a lot out of it and i think it ties in with my sort of whole situation of just sort of that going with the flow and some of it is like oh yeah i gotta do that but a lot of it is sort of self-affirming like oh i kind of already do that already yes, that's cool yes, for a reason. Yes. so i've gotten a lot out of it and i know a lot of people have too cool for being a massachusetts native i'm proud that it took you 58 minutes to drop your first wicked so that was ah. good <laughs> <laughs> it's the la in me, man. yes if, yes i'm proud of you if you were one of my buddies and we were having a couple of beers you wouldn't even be able to understand what i was saying I guarantee you. Nice, great great well, well song. <laughs> <laughs> talk to us about well there's one thing we were talking about authors which writers inspire you oh wow um I love uh, I love Michael Chabon a lot. Um, I love uh, I love the, I love a lot of the beat beat writers because it's so different from what I do. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of freewheeling type stuff, and again, the Zen and poetry in their writing. So I'm a big fan of all of all those guys, Kerouac and Ginsberg and Burroughs. Um, for children's books, I love J.K. Rowling. Obviously, who doesn't? Yes. Um, I grew up. Uh, reading, I think the big book that inspired me, without even knowing it, was um, uh, *Wrinkle in Time*, yes. which is a movie now. I'm not, yes. I haven't gone to see because I'm afraid to see it. You know, and <laughs> yeah. again, I have that yeah. movie in my head. Yeah. But I must have read that thing a dozen times. Um, there was a book called *Half Magic*, which oh. I. There's a movie called *Half Magic* out. It's totally not it. But and I don't know what happened to this book. It's a, it's a great children's book about. It's so me and Roe type idea. These kids are bored in the summer, there's nothing to do, and they find a coin, but it's half of a coin. It's a magical coin. So whatever you, you hold in your hand and wish for, you get half of that, which is open to interpretation. And I remember reading it thinking, I wasn't probably consciously thinking this as a kid, but it was just so clever to me, and twisted and funny and weird. <laughs> like I, something about the cat talks, but he can only mumble because they ask. You know, it's, it's not the obvious things. And I, I think that stuck with me. And, uh, and I've always loved that kind of stuff where it's, you set up an expectation and then you tweak it. Yeah. So any author who does that well, I'm a big fan of. Nice. Good. So we're, we're coming to the end of our interview, but there's just a couple more questions. We've had a nice review of your career, how you got your start, even when you were nine years old to now. What would be some of your most proudest accomplishments in your career so far? Ooh, career wise. Um, or life. I mean, accomplishments life-wise are my kids and family. Right. It wouldn't surprise you like I'm a pretty awesome dad. Like only because <laughs> I love being a dad. And my kids are now growing out of being little kids. And I'm still like, they're like, dude, come on. So I'm in trouble. I mean, in a couple of years, I'm going to be like hanging out in parks with puppet shows and doing Quest for the Key. And mom's going to be running away. But, um, you know, my family, I really, really put that at the top of the list of just not only having a family but just like the time spent and the quality of time it's really my number one thing as far as career wise I mean I would blend that in the way I balance career and that has been I've been very lucky to be able to do that and do that well and a lot of that credit goes to my wife who works and it really helps a lot um, but strictly I would say just you know cranking out seven books it feels pretty good 
you know, and those yeah. that first, you know, gosh, 2009 was when we, our first Herbert's Wormhole series book got published, and I'll never forget, Roe was at my house here in L.A. He was by coastal at the time, and we got this box, and we opened it, and there's just these fresh books <laughs> of his art, and you open it, and it's our words, and it, there's nothing like that feeling, and that's, that, that was just unbelievable, so I'm really proud of that. Cool. And you see, like, 2009, you really kind of first put out your first script, like, 1998, 99. Yeah. And then you know, 2009's 10 years, and now we're nine years after that. Mm -hmm. Like, what are your thoughts? You have to be very patient and resilient. <laughs> yeah. Like, how, how have you done it? One project a decade. That's me. That's me. <laughs> Steady Eddie. Um, well, it, it, it kind of harkens back to what we were talking about, where you, you never throw anything away. Like, you could... You wouldn't want to, but like you could like put any all, however many projects up on the board and you could string themes that came from this and that failed. Therefore, now it's over uh -huh. here. I mean, our animation stuff we didn't talk about, but some of the some of the TV stuff we've done. We did a, a pilot for Fox animated half hour pilot and we did a, um, the stuff for Comedy Central. That stuff is stolen. Again, you're just poaching from yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think. You got to get in the mindset of if you write the one thing and you wait around like I did with that one failure script about the gothic, whatever, uh, Fountain <laughs> of Youth. If I was just like, no, I'm going to keep I'd still be pitching that. And people would be like, you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> but you put it away and you move on to another thing right. and you keep working. You just keep moving forward because you have to keep yourself inspired, too. Like I'm a big deadhead. And one thing about the Grateful Dead I loved is how they and other bands do it, too, just not as well is uh, you, they, they kept themselves inspired by doing whatever they wanted with their own music. Dylan did it too. Like he never played the same song exactly the same way. He changed it up a lot. And uh, it's because otherwise you're just going to be one of those bands who regurgitates mm -hmm. the songs exactly the same way. And I think the same can be said in almost any creative endeavor. You have to keep yourself interested. And it's hard to do when it, you're creating it. And especially if you get a little lick of you know, success, success. they're going to want yeah. you to do that again. Yeah. And you're like, no, this is a gothic movie about the fountain of youth, okay? I know you want me to write Van Wilder 2, but look at this. And people are going to be like, what are you doing? You know, one quick thing about that, a little quick story. When I first got a new agent off of the first movie success, Ro got back into my life and we, were, we had another screenplay idea. Um, it was called Ethan and the Alphabet Re Re Revolution. And okay. it was about a kid who had trouble reading and he goes through this magical portal. There's always magical portholes in everything we do. Common theme. Yeah. And he got into a world where the alphabet was alive, okay? And they were animals. And Roe drew these beautiful animals that, like, an A was a flock of birds. Like, what okay. you'd imagine. It was unbelievable. And we're like, this is amazing. This is incredible. So I went into this agent, and this, I won't say his name because he's a big name agent now. Um, but he was, he liked me because I'd done these, okay, here we go. These are these, you know, kind of raunchy sitcom comedies and stuff. And I'm like, well, wait, just, I need to pitch you this. <laughs> and I, we pitched him this like thing of, so he's like, so it's about reading in the alphabet? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it couldn't have failed worse. It was so ridiculous. And as we're walking out, he kind of let Ro get ahead of me and he just kind of whispered in my ear dude, go be the bad boy, you know? <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that I kind of, maybe I'll do one of those again, but I, I had, you have to have your other vision and you have to know just because one person says no doesn't mean that's a bad thing, but you got to yes. keep it moving forward. Yes. Always, yes. always. Great, great. Tell people how they can find you online. Social media, do you have any of that? Hang uh, out? You know, I'm on, I'm, I'm not on Facebook. I'm on um, Instagram and Twitter, but it's sort of my own just rantings about the current <laughs> state of the world. And uh, so I wouldn't recommend that, but um you know, we have a website for the children's books, if anyone's interested. It's called CreatureKeepersBooks.com. And that's, it's, you know, it's made for kids, but it's got our, we've done some goofy YouTube videos about, he and I have done like Creature Keepers Corner, like a okay. little stupid show. And there's information about the books and how you can get them and stuff. And there's some updates on stuff we're up to in that world. And then, I mean, I could give out my email address if anyone, because I, which is pfrena at AOL.com. <laughs> AOL, everybody. A -O -L. Old school. Old school. And uh, just on that, I mean, I, 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 meet with, I meet with young kids who are looking to, like, how do I write stories? I've talked to kids who are, people at UCLA who, you know, 
I, I love giving advice to people. So yeah. whatever I can help, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So if anyone out uh -huh. there has questions or anything, I'm happy to. Well, hold that thought on. on advice. So first, before we sign off, just want to say thank you very much for interviewing with us and talking with us. It's been a great conversation. You're hilarious. Thank I you. respect your journey. I love the different projects you're doing. And also appreciate a lot of the advice you gave about just kind of, you know, chopping the wood and keep putting stuff out there. So we appreciate your wisdom. We let our Thank guests you. sign off the show with kind of giving any last minute words of wisdom or advice. So I'll turn the microphone over to you. Just say thank you and we'll, we'll be in touch real soon. Thank you very much. I really had a fun time. Sure. Um, I would say to anyone out there, contact me if you have any questions. But in general, uh, you know, there's a lot of people doing what we do. And uh, that can be daunting, but it can be really encouraging too. So you have to just be true to yourself, be open, and uh, keep doing it. Don't stop. Thanks. Cool. Thank you for listening to the Amani Experience Podcast. You can check out the show notes on amaniexperience.com slash podcast. Please remember to leave us a review on the platform you are listening on and share this podcast with anyone who you feel would benefit from listening. See you soon on our next episode.